Awesome. Well, welcome. And uh, my name is uh, Dr. Adrian Hillman, and I will be serving as the project director uh, for the initiative. So let's go ahead and uh, get started. All right, so today's agenda, uh, we will go over uh, the project overview for the Peer-to-Peer -peer Learning uh, Academy. Um, we will go into uh, the structure of how the funding came to CCF and the overall initiative. Uh, we'll then uh, transition into compliance uh, to talk a little bit more about specifics in the compliance department for this uh, grant opportunity, uh, followed by the important dates to remember. Uh, we will go over over uh, the application uh, to talk about things to uh, keep track of during the application process. And then we'll end it with a, a Q&A session. So if you didn't get your questions um, answered during the actual presentation, we're going to open up uh, the lines for this Q&A session. All right, so uh, meet the team. So our Trauma Prevention Partnerships crew here at uh, CCF uh, consists of Maria Garcia as our Senior Program Officer, providing the oversight and guidance for the project. Uh, myself, Adrian Hillman, as the Trauma Prevention uh, Project Director. We have Brianne O'Donohue, which will be the uh, Program Manager, uh, followed by Jose Nahara and Stephanie Vargas, which makes up our TPP compliance team, uh, the operation officer and then our compliance specialist. And then we have Jai Phillips as the uh, senior program officer uh, providing mentorship and guidance on the project. All right, so about us. Uh, so uh, the Office of Violence Prevention Partnerships Project uh, will fund community-based organizations to avert violent incidents, implement crisis response when violence does occur, and then address factors contributing to violence and to promote community healing. So specifically, uh, the project uh, will support communities disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19, uh, which are um, and avert the same communities that have seen an increase in violence. So just kind of looking at how the fund originated. Um, they started with the ARPA funding, the American Rescue Dollars, and then they filtered down to OVP, DPH. And then CCF was then awarded the opportunity to provide the grants to the community. So just in a nutshell, um, how the funds kind of trickled down to get us to where we are today. All right, so um, the project overview. So through the ARPA funds, uh, CCF's goal is to prevent uh, these violent incidents, implement crisis response when things do occur, and to address contributing uh, factors to gun and gang violence, increase access to trauma-informed care and healing centers services uh, and supportive efforts, and then to invest in upstream youth programs, youth engagement, youth leadership opportunities all across uh, the Los Angeles County. Um, the project is being implemented with an equity framework. So due to historical oppression, racism, and discrimination, people of color are often not provided the same opportunities and resources needed for individuals, including youth and families, to thrive. This investment provides an opportunity to support communities and individuals disproportionately impacted by violence tied to oppression and racism. Um, ideal grantee partners will demonstrate how their work is inclusive of an equity framework and survivor-centered approaches to advance peace and healing. All right, so um, let's talk about the funding strategies uh, that we are charged with uh, sharing with the community. So this project uh, will provide nearly $17 million in direct funding to an estimated 25 to 30 community-based organizations to build on the current strategies implemented by OVP and to align with uh, priorities that are defined through the OVP strategic plan based on the input from the community and community stakeholders. So we're here today to talk about peer-to-peer. -peer. So before we get into that, I wanted to introduce the other strategies uh, that we are funding under this initiative. Uh, so we've already released the street outreach and hospital violence uh, programs initiatives. Uh, we will later on uh, this fall be releasing the trauma-informed care, crisis response, youth programs and development uh, with a school-based violence initiative initiative, and then um, our community hardship, which will tie it all together. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and jump into the programming piece of why we're here today. 
So starting with the Peer-to-Peer -peer Learning Academy. So funding that's been made available. So uh, we are dedicating $1.5 million uh, of funding will be made through November 30th for the Peer-to-Peer -peer, uh, Learning Academy initiative. Uh, there will be an estimated one lead agency that will be selected for this partnership, uh, two subcontractors and up to 10 subject matter agencies or individuals to provide uh, guidance and trainings for the lead agency. And see. The funding source, again, will be made through this the ARPA funds uh, via the Los Angeles Department of Public Health, Office of Violence Prevention, through uh, Trauma Prevention Partnerships here at CCF. So I will now transition it over to the project manager, Brianne O'Donoghue, which will dive into the goals and role of the leading agency. Brianne? Thanks, Adrian. Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the grant opportunity at hand and how peer-to-peer -peer, the Training Academy fits into our programming. So quick pause for those folks who might be trying to take notes. I want to remind you that the information that I'm going to be sharing is taken straight from the RFP, which you have for reference. So it's nothing, nothing new. Um, and also a recording of this presentation will be posted online on our landing page. So if you do miss something, you'll have access to everything that was shared following the meeting. Um, these next slides are a little bit text heavy. So I didn't want anyone to get anxious about, oh, how am I going to find all that time to take notes? Don't worry. <laughs> um, so back to peer-to-peer. -peer. So the purpose of this funding is to support the build out of a community violence intervention training program specifically for peer specialists. So this is very much in line with the mission of TPP, which Adrian talked a little bit about. Since the peer specialists trained through this program will be focused on providing services such as crisis response, peace building, and community healing. We have three overarching goals for the program. The first is to build support or build the training infrastructure for CBOs to strengthen the skill sets of their peer workforce. The second goal is to support career pathways for our peer specialists. And the third is to test and develop recommendations through this program that will go on to inform a more permanent training academy to support OBP initiatives. So th that's a little bit about um, what we're hoping to achieve through this program. Now, the role of the lead agency, which may be what you're interested in applying for, is to facilitate the development and implementation of this training program. So as the lead agency for the project, you would bring together a group of peer specialists from different disciplines that will serve as an advisory body to design the main training course. You'll also subcontract with up to 10 agencies or individuals to deliver the core training and elective training to an estimated 500 participants. And then throughout the training process, you'll also be responsible for convening that advisory body to assess the effectiveness of the training modules. And that's really where these recommendations are going to come from that will be provided to CCF and OBP regarding the continuation of the program. Next slide, please. And so um, one of the primary key deliverables then is the development and implementation of a core community violence intervention or CBI training course. Now this course should draw from current best practice in the field, and we really envision creating a program that is intersectional. So what does this mean? That means that we want to draw from and respond to the needs of different types of peers and diverse communities. And this program should also address the ways that multiple forms of violence and trauma intersect and impact different communities. So ideally, a trauma-informed lens should be at the foundation of this training, and it should undergird everything from the training modules themselves to the incorporation of self-care for peer specialists in order to avoid secondary trauma. By making these uh, training opportunities welcoming and safe, and by connecting peers from diverse backgrounds, we're really aiming to improve access to mutual support and collaboration among peers. And then finally, we want to be able to measure how effective we were in meeting the program goals and how to best deliver the training program moving forward. So we do expect the lead agency to carry out a program evaluation in partnership with our TPP data and evaluation team to outline recommendations and a final report to be made to CCF and OVP. Next slide, please. And so um, I just mentioned some very high level key deliverables, but there is a more specific list um, and that touches on the specifics of what we're looking at uh, this lead agency to do in developing and coordinating the academy, how to implement it, and then of course, how to evaluate it. And um, that list is available in the RFP under section four key deliverables. Um, what I will share in addition to that is what we're looking for successful applicants to demonstrate. So successful applicants, 
will have experience designing and conducting trainings and will be able to incorporate that trauma-informed lens that I mentioned before, as well as adult learning principles. We really expect the lead agency to work with multiple organizations and that these organizations you know, may have different philosophies and approaches to doing the work. And so this lead agency needs to be an adept convener that's able to facilitate challenging conversations and move the group towards accomplishing the shared goals of the project. Beyond having experience in subject matter related to the training program, the lead agency should also have experience managing subcontracts and conducting peer-to-peer -peer training program evaluation. So they should also have that administrative experience as well. And I believe with that, I'm going to be passing it over to compliance to talk a little bit about uh, the compliance part of the RFP. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Jose Najera. I'm the Senior Compliance and Operations Officer here at CCF. I'll be going over some compliance items um, regarding the RFP. If you have any questions, again, please note them, and then we can answer them all at the end. The first item is eligible organizations. So in order to be eligible to apply, all applicants, both private sector and not-for-profit organizations, must have an active SAM.gov registration and not be suspended or debarred from receiving federal funding. So what we've done is we have asked as part of this application process for you to submit your UEI number so that we can verify and the printout that you have an active registration. Now, the big takeaway here is, luckily, if you don't, if you don't have a SAM.gov registration, you have time as of right now to sign up, get registered. Um, it takes, uh, usually it takes about a week or two for the entire process to, to get through. If there's any questions, please let us know. But we want to highlight that you need to have it in order for us to contract with you. So it's not a requirement to apply, but it is a requirement of once if you get selected to contract with you. As part of a lead agency, um, you're going to be responsible for confirming that the people that you're subcontracting with have um, the same requirements, that they have a SAM.gov uh, registration, and, that, and to verify that they're not suspended or debarred from receiving any state, local, or federal funding. As part of the application as well, you're going to be submitting a subrecipient profile form, which again, once you've identified who you're going to choose to contract with, um, you're going to be uh, filling out the form and submitting it for our review. Eligible applicants must also comply with all conflict of interest requirements. There is a form to be completed. So once you are selected and we go through the contracting phase, uh, we'll be able to provide that form in order for you to complete, sign, and return. La uh, other item is applicants must also have a 501c3 nonprofit status in order to apply as part of your eligibility. And last but not least, organizations must be located in LA County. Next is budgets. Budgets are required to be submitted with the application. The budget template has been provided and posted on the website. I'll be going over further and detailed and showing you the actual budget template in a little bit. Timeliness and, standard, uh, and standards. The proposer is expected to demonstrate the ability to begin pro project operations by the contract's start date, which is to be determined, but no later than October 20th and to fully utilize the grant funds within the proposed contract term. Joint offers. When it comes to joint offers, we're not taking any joint applications. What we're doing is uh, you need to identify if you're gonna partner with another agency, who the prime, aid, who the prime or lead agency is gonna be in the application, um, and then identify who your partner is. Proposed subrecipients. So when it comes to subrecipients, we indicated earlier on that proposal, um, on the proposed for subrecipients form, uh, you're, you're, you're required to identify for our approval so that we can also verify that people are eligible to apply and to receive those funds. Proposed agreement. The proposer, if selected through this RFP and subsequently selected for the award, shall be required to enter into a written agreement. Um, now, the big takeaway here is applicants unable to or unwilling to comply with CCF policies and procedures will not be considered for funding under this RFP. Please review the sample LTR agreement, which stands for Lower Tiered Recipient, um, that has been posted on the website. 
Uh, I can't stress this point enough. Please review it. Make sure that you can abide by all the terms and conditions. Again, if there's any questions that you have, please write them. We'll try to answer them as quickly as possible, but you need to make sure that you review it with your, with your agency and anybody that's gonna be involved in the process in order to make sure that you qualify, that you're edu eligible and that you're willing to abide by the terms and conditions. The written questions portions of this, uh, I, I believe Adrian's gonna go through the, the timeline for the written questions a little bit earlier, but um, I mean, a little bit later, but I do wanna point out that for questions, written questions can and must be submitted by 5 p.m. July 28th in order for us to be able to have time to answer them. So in order to keep fairness with this process, not only will we be answering questions during this RFP uh, bidder's proposal conference towards the end, um, we'll be able, we're going to be able to uh, write out all of the questions and answers for everybody to see so that everybody can get all of the same information um, uh, to keep fairness with this process. Um, if you have any questions on this, please let us know. Uh, we will be uh, writing the responses that from all the questions that we received on the website no later than three business days from the written question deadline. Applicants are responsible for checking the CCF website to obtain current information and responses. The big uh, other note that I want to point out is that we're not required to, we're not allowed to answer any questions. So please do not reach out to CCF staff, to DPH staff on an individual basis, whether email or telephone call. We're not required to answer any questions, one offs. Uh, again, the process is to write out the questions submitted so that we can put them and gather them all together. And again, this goes back to keeping the process fairness and ensuring that everybody has the same information. For addendum and uh, for RFP addendum and clarifications, um, for this process is we want to make sure that if anything changes for this RFP, if anything changes, whether it's a budget, whether it's a timeline, whether it's a request, anything that changes on their RFP. Um, by law, again, we're supposed to post it um, publicly on the website. So please, please, please check the website, especially right before you submit your application. If there are some changes, if there's been an addendum posted, uh, please, you want to make sure that you're giving yourself an opportunity to review and get all uh, future or further um, information in regards to the application. When it comes to the application conditions and reservations, um, the actual RFP has a list of all of these uh, conditions, award conditions, applications, conditions, and reservations. So please make sure that you read them carefully. I'm not going to read them all here, um, but they are lengthy. So again, please make sure that you go through them. If you have any questions, please write them out. We'll try to answer as many of them as we can during this uh, bidders conference. And then what we can, we'll definitely post it in writing. A risk assessment. As part of this application process, we are asking for folks to submit the risk assessment tool that we provided, also posted on the website. Um, we will not be scoring the risk assessment. It will not be taken into account in the scoring um, or eligibility portion of your application. The reason we want to have it in-house is because it's, it's a timing issue. Once we've identified who we're going to be choosing um, and who's going to be selected to contract for this award, we want to make sure we have it in-house so that we can review and we don't have that lag time and have to ask for it at that time and then wait. Again, it's a timing issue and that we have internally in order to meet our deadline, we want to make sure that, that we have the information already in-house. Next is... As promised, we will be going over the budget template a little bit more in detail. So the budget template is here. I'm going to be going over the tabs very briefly, but I do urge you in order, like I said, to be able to submit a fully completed budget to ensure that you read the budget instructions here. It's very detailed. The budget template is for a 13-month time frame. With completing budget, please do your best to capture the true nature of the funding amounts being requested. The other, the other thing that we've done here is, I'm gonna go through the line item definition. We've literally put in line items here and we've defined them as samples. 
So you have an opportunity to review and know not only what's eligible. Now, it's not an all-inclusive list. Um, if you feel that there are other costs associated with the program that need to be included in the budget, please make sure that you put it in your actual budget template, which is here. So this is the budget template. Um, we've put in line items for full-time employees, part-time employees. You put your monthly salary here. You put the percentage of time, whether it's 100% if they're fully dedicated to the program, 50% of the time if there it's only half, and, and the It'll, it's calculated um, automatically here. We've highlighted the blue sections where you are to complete and fill information. When it comes to these line items or non-operating items, you want to make sure you put a brief description as to what the cost entails so that we have a little bit more detail as to the uh, line items that you're proposing to put in your budget. I'm going to scroll down here. When it comes to travel and mileage, please keep in mind, and I'm going to go back here for the line item definition, there is um, the, the federal rate in regards to mileage reimbursement. Make sure that you use that rate when you're uh, doing your calculations to come up with that budget amount. Um, there's a couple of big takeaways here, um, as Brianne indicated, and if you read the, the, uh, the RFP a little bit more in depth, there are some requirements in regards to subcontracting with CVI uh, for, C or for CVI initiatives. And it's the lead agency would be, will be required to subcontract with two CVI agencies for $250,000 each. So we've already embedded that in the budget. Additionally, you are to subcontract for other required to identify and contract with up to 10 subject matter experts or agencies with the mini grants for a $500,000 amount. So we've already embedded that, that, that um, I'm sorry, that dollar amount here so that you can work around completing the further budget but keep it within the $1.5 million budget amount. The minimum rate, when it comes to indirect cost rate here, you have the option for these federal funds to either go with the NICRA, uh, which is a negotiated indirect cost rate, if you have a letter for an indirect cost rate, you are to provide it, and then you can use that percentage. If you don't, then you can go with the 10% de minimis rate. What we've done here is we've provided a de minimis worksheet. This is an instruction page that covers some of the expenditures and descriptions, and then we've also done the calculation worksheet. Again, if you have any questions, please reach out, but it's pretty self-explanatory. You're gonna be putting in, your, based on once you've completed your budget, you will be going line by line item, completing this form. If there are some restrictions and some line items that are not, um, uh, that are disallowed as part of the indirect cost rate built in, you would put those amounts here. It'll automatically calculate it and it'll give you the amount here, which you would translate and put down here. So just want to make sure that you guys are aware. Um, and what I've done is we've actually put in an equation. So once you come out with an actual amount here, it'll directly translate into your budget. If you have any questions on this, please let me know. I know it's kind of a tedious process. Um, it's Please be as detailed as possible when it comes to your budget, not only personnel and non-personnel wise, and hopefully all of this information that we provided will be helpful in easing your budget um, Submission. Adrian, kick it back to you. Thank you. Let me pivot back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, did you want to go over this or work it? Yeah, I think I already went through this. So again, it's a 13 month uh, budget template. Sorry about that, Adrian. <laughs> no problem. Uh, completing your budgets, please make sure that you're capturing the true nature of the amounts. Uh, the modified total direct cost, as you guys seen, I went through that worksheet and we've already, uh, $1 million of the 1.5 has already been earmarked in the budget for again, contracting services. Thanks, Adrian. Fantastic. No problem. Thank you. All right. So let's uh, talk a little bit um, about the uh, checklist criteria and the application scoring. So um, I'll turn it over to Brianne. 
Yes, so we wanted to give you an idea of what our review committee is going to be looking for when they're scoring your applications. So we've broken it down into seven different criteria or groups. The first being adherence to RFP instructions. I think this is pretty straightforward. Reviewers are going to be assessing if the application was submitted on time, if it's complete, and if it's of high quality. So that means free of typos, spelling errors, or any kind of those smaller mistakes that sometimes come up. And then for the experience section, as I mentioned, um, we're looking for one lead organization to develop and conduct the training program in conjunction with an advisory board and multiple subrecipient organizations. So the organization in question should not only have experience with some of the subject matter of the training, um, but must also have experience in managing subrecipient contracts, building working relationships with other organizations, and evaluating programs. Um, I think we recognize that the training topics are many, and so as a lead agency, you don't necessarily have to be an expert in every single topic, but we do want you to have some connection to the subject matter um, in addition to that administrative capacity and experience. And so the reviewers for this section will score to what degree the applicant exhibits experience in the areas that I mentioned and how they would build on this experience to realize the peer-to-peer -peer training academy. For the third section, this is project philosophy. Um, applicants should display a strong rationale or reasoning for the proposed training model that they will play, to, play a lead role in developing. Um, and so there is a question in the RFP that asks applicants just to talk a little bit about um, what a proposed training model might look like, how you might approach this task of developing out this model. So the model should incorporate the topics listed in the RFP and adopt a trauma-informed approach. And, and you know, basically this is all about um, um, restoring a sense of control, safety, and choice to survivors of violence. Again, ideally, the training would accomplish this goal using a racial equity lens that the needs of specific uh, disproportionately impacted by violence in the wake of quarantine. Finally, the applicant should demonstrate innovative and interdisciplinary thinking in how they engage adult learners and how they ultimately propose to address those root causes of community violence. Um, we're really looking for um, the lead agency to bring something new to this training because there are existing CVI training programs out there, but we're really looking for you to create um, a training program that is holistic, that is intersectional, as I mentioned, um, and that finds unique ways to engage adult learners. And so we're really looking for you to think outside of the box and, and bring something new uh, that'll be relevant to a wide range of peer specialists. So um, reviewers will primarily use the applicant's response to that proposed training model question to score this section. The next section is feasibility, efficiency, and sustainability. So applicants should explain a clear path for efficiency that incorporates their existing infrastructure and ways to continue to scale or replicate the process along with a detailed budget. So attached budgets, uh, the ones that Jose just actually went, went over, those will be reviewed and evaluated for this question. And then for program Program evaluation, um, reviewers will assess if the applicant presented a clear picture of how data will be collected and used to determine systems of change and how outcomes are obtained. Um, now, as I mentioned, we do have a, a data and evaluation team with us here at TPP that the lead agency will be working closely with to um, evaluate their program. And of course, like, you know, this is very much still in the, in the ideation phase. And so for this question, we're really looking to hear your initial thoughts about what data might be useful to collect as we're developing this training academy and how you would go about collecting that data. And then the site visit and interview. So members of the TPP team will be conducting site visits for qualified applicants, um, not everyone, those who move forward to the next round of evaluation. And for those applicants, we will use the interview as an opportunity to learn more about your proposal, to verify some of the things that you shared, to talk more about your ideas, and just to get to know your organization a little bit better as a whole. We'll talk a little bit more about this later on in the presentation, um, but I'm going to pass it over to Adrian to talk more about the letters of support that last um, category there. All right. Thank you. Uh, so letters of support. Uh, we will be uh, requiring uh, letters of support for the Peer-to-Peer -peer Learning Academy RFP. And uh, what those required letters of support uh, should do is highlight the organization's expertise in implementing peer-to-peer -peer trainings or related services and the nature of their relationship or partnership. So um, there will be three sections to upload these documents. So the first will be a community a community organization organization your agency has partnered with on peer training. So uh, we're looking for a letter of support from an agency that you've 
um, already partnered with in the past to conduct peer trainings. Uh, the second will be a community organization with expertise in community violence intervention that has partnered with your agency on peer trainings. Uh, the third is an optional uh, letter of support for uh, from a community uh, government entity uh, that your agency may have partnered with uh, to design peer training. So um, the optional letter, I'll just say, uh, could just be from um, a law enforcement agency or so forth uh, that you may have worked with uh, to conduct trainings um, with. So letters should include uh, entities which an applicant has provided uh, comparable services. Letters should of support should include the entity's name, contact person, phone number, and a description of those services that were provided and the dates of the services that were provided. All right, so we'll go into uh, how to actually apply for this opportunity. So before then, uh, Brianne um, will explain the dates to remember. Yes, a very important slide. So as you all know, the RFP was released on July 19th, and today, July 25th, is the proposal conference. You're all here, so hopefully you know that. Our next deadline coming up, as Jose mentioned, is the written questions deadline, which is this Friday, July 28th at 5 p.m. Um, so for those of you who maybe haven't heard of written questions or are wondering what that means, um, I, this means that I would encourage you to ask your questions today during this meeting, because any questions that come up after today's meeting will have to be submitted via email to be answered on our website. So if you do need to submit a written question, be sure to get your questions in by the 28th, again, this Friday, because we cannot answer any questions during the last week of the application period. So of course, you know, we understand that some questions about tech issues might come up during that, that last week. So maybe like the website isn't loading properly or you're having some other kind of technical difficulty. And those questions are absolutely appropriate for that final week of the application period. However, RFP content questions will not be answered after July 28th. So in a nutshell, please reach out if there's a tech issue. We definitely want to make sure that you get everything turned in on time. So as you're reviewing the application materials, you know, rewatching this, um, you know, bidder's proposal, if there are any concerns that do come up, please, please, please email us your questions um, by this Friday. So following the written questions deadline, we have the deadline to submit um, the RFP, which is August 4th at 5 p.m. And then following the RFP um, submission, I mentioned that qualified organizations will receive a site visit and interview by members of the TPP team sometime during the week of August 8th to 11th. So we'll reach out to schedule these site visits via phone call. So if you can, please keep an eye out um, for a call during that second week of August, because we want to be sure to schedule those, you know, as soon as we can to keep the process going along. And then finally, we plan to send out notifications of a final decision either way, whether um, you are awarded the grant or not. Um, we should have that out to you by September 23rd. And then following that, it's our desire to have the agreement um, in place with the selected organization to start on or before October 20th. Thank you. All right, so um, going into the actual application process, so um, Jose did go over uh, this during the compliance portion, so just a couple of quick reminders, uh, both private and not-for-profit organizations must have the active SAM.gov registration and not be barred or suspended uh, from receiving federal funding, so uh, we definitely want to uh, make sure that you have that process either started or you um, have an active account with the SAM.gov. Um, applicants will be uh, required to apply via SurveyMonkey apply application, which we're going to talk about next. Um, and that's through our CalFund um, smapply.org website. And then all the templates that Jose uh, mentioned will be provided online, um, are currently provided online at our uh, landing page, uh, which is there. Um, Maria Garcia just popped into the chat the actual uh, link to the landing page for Trauma Prevention Partnerships, which all of this is outlined on there. And you can find all of these clickable links there. 
Okay, so uh, looking at the Survey Monkey Apply application. So when you do go to our uh, landing page for the actual application, you will see here that we have several different opportunities that um, the California Community uh, Foundation has published. Um, and there you will find our Trauma Prevention Partnerships peer-to-peer -peer application here. So once you click on that, you'll be able to select to move forward in that process. Um, after you've uh, set up your account, uh, you've put in all of your information, uh, to begin the application uh, process in the portal. Um, it's going to open up to the actual application here. So I just wanted to kind of point out a couple of things. So this is a test application uh, that we started here to uh, be able to kind of walk through. So uh, when you um, are in the portal, you will see the different components here outlined uh, for the actual application. So first, starting with your organization and program information is where we're going to collect all the information about you um, in the organization, who the signers are, and the key players within the organization, followed by the application questions. That there is where uh, Brienne has introduced a lot of those essay questions, where we're going to be seeking information uh, to demonstrate how your organization has uh, developed trainings. We'll uh, ask questions related to um, the actual model that you're proposing and so forth. So that's where you will um, actually input all of that information. Um, the geography section um, and the organization demographics are just collecting information about the actual uh, project or the uh, program that you're working with. Um, and then you'll see we have here the uh, budget uh, upload. So uh, the link that was provided, you will see that uh, budget template on that uh, link that was put into the chat. Um, and that's where you will get that budget from to upload in this budget section on the actual application. Uh, so you'll fill all of that out and um, upload it there. The SAM.gov registration that um, Jose uh, went over during the compliance portion as well uh, will be required uh, for you to upload either your actual application that says that you're in good standing with SAM.gov or the registration. If you um, have not applied for SAM.gov, we recommend that you do it ASAP, meaning probably by the end of today because it could take a couple days for that application to be approved for you to move forward. So we need to see that confirmation page that um, your SAM.gov account uh, has been initiated. And then you will see there your letters of support that we just went over uh, to upload from a past partner and then also a subject matter um, expert in the community and then your um, uh, the optional letter from a government entity. So once all of these check marks are complete, then you will be able to review the entire application before you submit. So I will say again, and I know that we've probably repeated this um, earlier, is that this application is earmarked to lock at 5 p.m. So that means that if you are in the midst of uh, uploading or filling out the application, uh, the submit buttons will go offline um, at 5 p.m. Um, on August 4th. So I did want to actually mention that piece. Um, in past experience, we do have um, folks that go on and try to submit and the email address could be incorrect. There could be an error with an upload or data. So I would encourage you all to begin the final submissions of your application earlier um, than um, five o'clock, uh, just to make sure that you are able to get it submitted on time. So again, just repeating, Friday, August 4th at 5 p.m. The applications will lock. All right, so uh, we are now to the portion of um, the actual proposal conference where we will be initiating the Q&A. So I uh, just quickly will mention um, a couple of the commonly asked questions here, um, all which is found on the actual RFP. So the first one is how will grant decisions be made? So in partnership with DPH, there will be three staff from the California Community Foundation and then two staff from the Department of Public Health who will make up or consist of this um, committee, this review committee that will be reviewing and making the final decisions uh, for the grant uh, process. Uh, the final uh, CCF board of directors will make uh, their final vote at the board meeting on September 26th. Uh, and then we will move forward with making that announcement of uh, who the um, applicant will be awarded. Uh, the second question is, uh, what is the anticipated size and timeline of the grant? So again, uh, this grant opportunity is uh, $1.5 million, which we will be awarded a lead agency to take the initiative to work with the two sub uh, awards, as well as up to 10 um, 
subcontracts for industry subject matter experts and then that uh, deadline for or the timeline for the grant is currently November 30th with a possible extension to December um, of uh, 2024. How are the grants um, or how, if funded, how may the grant funds be used? So proposals must submit direct service projects and therefore funds should support programmatic costs, uh, programmatic costs. For indirect costs, if you have a current negotiated indirect cost rate agreement, which is what we went over with Jose, um, established with a federal conjugate agency, then you may use uh, that rate. If the LTR does not have uh, this cost rate agreement, uh, the recipient may elect to use a de minimis rate of 10%, which is what Jose went over in pursuant of uh, the two CFR regulations there. Is that a whole mouthful? But again, uh, we did walk through that. And if you did need to re review that section, we are going to uh, post this video. Um, what are the data collection requirements for this grant? All grantees will be responsible for sharing uh, qualitative and quantitative data with our evaluation partners. Uh, LMU is on the call. Thank you all for attending. Uh, data will enhance our collective understanding of program strengths, challenges, promising practices, and will uh, undergrade policy and programmatic recommendations. The data will vary from program type and will be tied to each grantee partner's grant objectives. Um, and then uh, will this funding, um, will this funds uh, need matching sources? And the answer to that question is no. So um, at this moment, I will open up uh, the proposal for questions. Uh, feel free to raise your hand and we can uh, move forward with calling you accordingly. Uh, looks like one question was popped into the chat. Uh, are LA uh, County certified social enterprises eligible to submit as the lead agency? And I will pivot that question to Jose. Um, we'll look into it and we'll post the answer on the website. I don't think that there's an issue, but um, we'll, we'll research it further and we'll post it as part of the answers. Thank you. Okay, just going back in the chat to answer a question. Looks like there was one question that was posted about access to terms and conditions, and the answer was there posted. Please refer to the RFP uh, section 13 um, of the proposed agreement. So that was there. Let's see if there's any additional. Okay, um, as lead agency applicants responsible for identifying sub grantees. Um, I can actually take that question. Um, we uh, would like the lead agency to take the initiative to um, produce the proposal for your sub grantees. And we can assist with that as long as, uh, as well as the Department of Public Health with identifying sub grantees. We're, we're more than happy to assist with that, but uh, we will um, have that as a responsibility of the lead agency. Great question. As a, as a community uh, developed corporation, do you require experience in trauma prevention? Awesome, another uh, great question. So uh, we do not uh, require experience in trauma prevention partnerships, uh, but we do, um, we would like to have uh, the lead agency subcontract with the industry subject matter experts. So that's why we're allowing uh, room for up to 10 subject matter experts. Um, our goal with the lead agency is to be able to train or outline a best possible practice for the Learning Academy model. Um, so a lead agency would demonstrate an ability to build this uh, academy out, um, must have, and Brian went over that into the, the lead agency roles, but must have an ability to uh, facilitate a learning academy. Um, let me go back up. Is the third letter of reference required, even if it doesn't come from a, a government agency? Uh, good question. Um, it is not required. The, the government agency letter is not required. It is an optional letter. Um, how long are the subcontracts? Uh, the subcontracts will be the duration of the actual award. Uh, so our award is 13 months. Uh, so the uh, subcontractors award would be at the conclusion of uh, the actual grant, which would sunset at a potential December of 2024. 
So is it that only lead agencies can apply or expert agencies apply on their own for 50K portion? Uh, for this actual award, uh, we are looking for lead agency applications. Uh, once the lead agency is named, then we will pivot towards their process for uh, the sub awards. If you do have an interest in that, you can uh, share that information uh, with us at our uh, CCF slash TPP um, dot org uh, email address, and we can um, share that information with the lead agency if you're interested in uh, the sub awards. Um, and we, we can make sure that you get the information once that um, notification goes out that they're accepting uh, applications for that. Um, is an agency experience with providing peer-to-peer -peer training and viable applicants, even if they are not a subject matter experts in violence prevention and intervention? So, um, yes, yes, yeah, same question um, that was asked. Uh, the goal of a lead agency is to be able to facilitate uh, this learning academy, build it out um, as a pilot program. Uh, we are looking for agencies that um, have uh, some interest or some areas of interest or some level of uh, being familiar with uh, prevention work and uh, conducting trainings on violence prevention. Uh, one assist that we did build into this um, proposal is that uh, you conduct a board uh, that is going to help you facilitate and navigate through the subject matter experts. We've also outlined on um, within the RFP the list of uh, the topics that we would like to have uh, presented through the lead agency. Uh, so want to just make mention of that. Um, will a list of conference participants be shared and provided? Uh, we will not be posting a list of participants. Um, is there a way to be listed as a sub-recipient contract so that the winning lead agency can find organizations uh, to work with them? Absolutely. So again, if that's something that you are interested in, um, the sub-awards and subject matter experts, uh, please feel free to email uh, the CCF team, and we can uh, put the list together as well if you would like uh, interest in that. But again, lead agency will be taking lead on uh, granting and facilitating the subject matter experts. You're welcome. All right, let's see. Is there a target area in LA County to focus on that is being uh, prioritized? Not uh, so much for the Learning Academy, uh, just because the Learning Academy will be um, a LA County based initiative. So uh, they will be training all of LA County. There will not be a prioritized community um, for this Learning Academy, though um, we are definitely looking for lead agencies that will um, conduct grant making and with an equitable framework. So I'll, I'll put that out there, but it uh, does not have to be a specific priority community that um, will focus on or be targeted. Great question. All right. Uh, can subgrantees have uh, multidisciplinary trainings, topics, uh, can occur multiple subawards? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so what we found in uh, the development of this RFP is that uh, there could be a host of different subject matters as we created the list. So um, if an organization, the lead organization may be a subject matter expert in one of those areas, then they have the opportunity to subcontract with other grantees that make up the other experts um, information in the other areas. All right, let's see. Uh, next question. Um, is there is the letter of reference from an agency experience with violence prevention um, or intervention based on self-reporting the agency affirm? Let me see. There we go, it's kind of covered up. Um, the agency affirm uh, that they do the work or uh, do they have to meet some requirements to be experienced in violence prevention? Uh, so we have two separate letters that are required. So one letter is a community-based organization that should support um, the efforts that you uh, conduct trainings in the community. Uh, the second letter should be from um, an experienced organization uh, within trauma prevention, violence prevention, uh, trauma-informed care services, or any um, anti-violence initiative um, as paired with our overall initiative and as violence, pre uh, violence reduction within um, LA County. Um, 
the CCF uh, prefer that two proposed sub recipients for 250 only be identified through an open process following the grant award of lead agency, or will it be appropriate to describe potential partners within the proposal? Absolutely. If you already have um, different um, connections, then that would be wise if you uh, did put those into the actual um, RFP proposal. Um, however, we do operate on an open um, proposal policy process, which means that um, though you may have the actual connections um, and the relationships with other organizations, we want to make sure that it's open and that all other agencies that may qualify have an opportunity to. But it would be nice to know that you have experience working with um, the proposed subrecipients for the um, 24K. Okay. Um, uh, I'm yeah. going to add a couple of things here. Sure. So great question. So first is identifying whether it's going to be a subcontractor or a subrecipient re relationship in nature. Um, once you've identified that, we ask you and we urge that you follow your procurement policies and procedures and that you also make reference to the two CFR procurement standards when it comes to these federal funds. So hopefully that's enough information for to guide you. But to Adrian's point, if you do have agencies that you've already identified, again, just please follow your procurement standards. Um, and again, if you have any specific questions or more detailed questions, please be uh, please uh, submit them in writing and we'll try to provide as much guidance as possible. A great question. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Jose, for following up on that. Um, all right. So it uh, looks like one additional question is um, there a maximum number of letters of support uh, that should be provided? Um, I will say uh, up to three, uh, but the requirement is one. So if you submit one, um, that uh, should um, be sufficient enough for the application. Uh, but we do know that uh, there are organizations that have uh, submitted up to uh, three for the actual letters of support. All right, uh, team. Yeah, um, I received a private question, so I just yes. want to make yep. sure I share that in fairness. Um, so I had an organization message me and say that they've been awarded um, already through our TPP grant program. And so they were wondering if they can still apply for this RFP as well. And I said they absolutely can still apply to this RFP. So if you do happen to have already been awarded something by TPP in our last phase of grant making, you're still eligible to apply for the peer to peer program and our future funding strategies. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, team, was there any other direct uh, messages that you received? No, not on our end. All righty. Um, another one. Uh, can letters of support be provided by the Department of Public Health? Um, I will caution you on the fact that DPH, um, the OVP, department uh, has been instrumental in the development of these awards and the proposals. So uh, the uh, Office of Violence Prevention uh, will be excluded from letters of support, but the Department of Public Health is huge. So if there are um, letters of support from outside um, divisions of DPH, uh, that's absolutely fine. However, anyone connected with the project uh, will not be able to submit letters of support. Um, and future procurements, can the submission turnaround time be longer than two weeks? Thanks in advance. <laughs> Great question. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, we are initiating an advanced process for this RFP to onboard this organization um, a lot sooner, which is why this RFP uh, process is going to be a little bit more accelerated. But uh, for future um, submissions and future strategies, we will be um, instrumental in making sure that is longer. Thank you, uh, Mr. Johnson. All right, um, any other questions? It looks like we have about uh, four more minutes. Just want to uh, make sure that um, we're able to answer the questions live. And then again, uh, while we're waiting for any final question, um, if you have any other questions that kind of come up, I know you're going to dive into the application now and start reviewing and filling out, which we encourage that you do. Um, we There could be questions that come up. So again, Brianne has uh, mentioned all other questions outside of this live um, taping of the RFP can be submitted via email to uh, our TPP email account, and we will post those on the landing page uh, so that um, everybody has access to all of the answers there. So again, final questions of 
should be due by Friday. Um, and then after Friday, uh, the team will not be able to respond during the last week of the actual RFP to any other questions unless they are tech questions. So if you're stuck, you're locked out of um, application, it needs to be reset. Those types of questions we're definitely able to uh, facilitate because we want to make sure that you get in on time. But after five o'clock, we will not accept tech questions then. Um, so it looks like one final question. Um, how will regional coverage be lifted up? Um, help me understand that, Kim. You may want to come off mute for that one. I will, no problem. Thank you. So I'm thinking about this because we're in Spa One, Antelope Valley, High Desert, sure. part of LA County, but also removed in a sense. So if there's one lead that's covering all of LA County, is it built into the process that, you know, maybe you get, um, you know, a stronger, more points if you're able to show that you can touch the various spas that are within LA County so that one region is not left out? That's, that's kind of my concern. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So within our um, actual application, uh, you see the uh, demographics and the, ge uh, the geography sections. That's there where we would love for the organizations that are applying to demonstrate their ability to work in the other areas. So at that time is where we will be um, assessing and looking at the reachability of LA County. But this or lead organization must be able to work in all of LA County, whether it is Antelope Valley or down to um, the Long Beach area area South LA. Uh, so we want to make sure that, you know, definitely that that is clear. So if you are a lead agency in the Antelope Valley or way down in South um, LA, you are still definitely able to apply. Um, so there will be no like special points given, but it's a, a kind of mandatory that uh, you have the accessibility to be able to operate and work with all of LA County. Uh, because the goal is for us to be able to filter through um, participants to actually take the trainings and get the certifications. So you have to be able to train um, everyone. But uh, great question. So uh, we do have one more minute, and I did want to take the opportunity to uh, transition over to um, one of our partners um, on the project uh, for an upcoming um, activity that we will be initiating this week. Uh, so Felicia, take it away. Yes, thank you. Felicia Jones with Social Good Solutions, and we are contracted to uh, support community engagement and outreach. And this Thursday, we are uh, sponsoring a listening, a virtual listening session. I'm gonna just drop, uh, unless someone else has it, a link for folks to register, to participate. Uh, this, uh, the, again, this Thursday at 10 a.m. to 12, we really wanna hear from you all to really help inform uh, how we roll out the, the next RFPs that are gonna come up, how we support your strategies. Um, we wanna make sure that folks who have not been able to participate in these kinds of uh, opportunities have access. So we want you to help inform us on how we best do that. So again, strongly encouraging you to register. Um, I'm gonna try to drop this link here. If you're able to uh, click it and then uh, register and join us. We look forward to seeing you there and I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Felicia. All right, so uh, we will be concluding right on time. It is 11 o'clock, so uh, thank you all for participating. Uh, we will, if we didn't get to your question, looks like one came into the chat. If we did not get to your question, we will be posting all of the Q&As that were received today on our website uh, for further viewing, as well as this, uh, the actual recording from today will actually go on our website as well for you to refer back to. So again, um, welcome to CCF if you're new, um, and we uh, encourage you all to apply. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day. Thank you everyone.